Thank you. So I had planned on everyone being sleepy, so I'll warn you now that this is going to be super giffy. Um, hopefully, we'll get your attention. <laughs> Actually, I was really impressed when I found this GIF that I didn't realize Giphy has like a GIF, Giphy Studios, and this is actually their image, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, so API design anti-patterns is something that um, I'm actually going to jump forward. We've talked about before. Um, so if you've kind of uh, seen me at a conference or you know, tripped across stuff online, you may have seen this topic. Um, but it's not exactly the same thing that we'll talk about. Um, so if you are interested in that stuff, um, it, it should tweet out a link here in two minutes or so. Um, I put it in the buffer. So that way you guys will have the link if you want to follow up on it later. There's um, a lot of good kind of fundamentals and basics there. Uh, this is a little bit different today, but um, we'll talk about me first. So uh, Typeform's where I work. It's, um, I have to talk to them about the swag. The name is on the back. Um, and I keep, they keep forgetting to give me t-shirts. Um, so we're going through right now, uh, first of all, Typeform is, uh, we do forms. And uh, it's kind of like really generic and basic, but it uh, could be anything from surveys and NPS kind of stuff onto user registration on somebody's site, uh, embedded, whatever. So our business is taking whatever the definition of somebody's form is and turning it into something that gets rendered out to get the answers. So it's a little bit tricky because everything's super ambiguous and that's the challenge I'm interested in. Um, so we're going through a big replatforming. Product's only a few years old, doing a lot of microservice development. Um, and uh, I, we have some developer stuff now. I wouldn't necessarily encourage you to go dig in too deeply right now because I'm not super happy with where it's at. But beginning of next year should be a big shift for us as these microservices start getting more public, um, which is why I'm bringing you some mistakes that we're fixing. <laughs> My previous experience was with PayPal and Braintree. That's probably, um, in fact, that's definitely the last time that I've sort of published or talked about anything. Um, so my whole job there was reviewing all the APIs that PayPal built. Um, so I've seen tons of mistakes. Um, every developer's first attempt at APIs um, is full of them, right? Um, if you haven't done it before, there's a lot of things that don't come natural. So I tend to collect mistakes. I keep tons of notes on like common things that I see all the time. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to dig into. Uh, I also helped build up uh, the API program at Uship, which is a shipping uh, marketplace, and then at Wayport before it was acquired by AT&T, which that's now AT&T Wi-Fi. Um, so I've been doing APIs for a while. That's the point of that list. Um, and you may have tripped across some blogs that I've written um, at API UX or Pragmatic API. They're getting pretty old at this point because I've been terrible at writing for the last few years. But interesting stuff out there. So. Um, the difference between what I've talked about before with sort of anti-patterns anti and API design versus what we'll talk about today, um, usability issues are kind of what I usually talk about is like things that confuse people when they try to use your API or things that present you a design scale issue. In other words, if you design it this way, you're going to get stuck in the future where you can't add on to it. Um, but what we're talking about today is operational issues, things that, that actually break your system when it goes live. Uh, if you design it in a certain way. So there are some aspects of building a system that are about you know, getting the right database or putting the right web application in front of it, whatever. To some extent, the way you design your API can set you up for failure. I think some of this will be a little bit remedial for those of you that have done a lot of APIs. Um, my hope is that there's a spectrum in here, so we'll step up. It may start a little boring, but bear with me. Um, so the first one is, is using get instead of post. And I, I would normally not even cover this topic because it seems so basic, but I think I was surprised to find that um, we actually had this and it actually caused a bug. And it was an interesting one as to how it got there. So I thought I'd share it because it was kind of cool to see it. It's been a while. Um, basically, when you go to a form that we've uh, presented to a user, so in this case, my menu at work. Every week, uh, we have lunch brought in to the office and we get like our menu sent to us on a, on a form. We answer all those questions, and that's what you eat next week. So when we are landing on this form, uh, it's a get for landing, uh, which gives us a landing token, which is basically a way for us later to go back, once we've answered all those questions and submitted the answers, um, now we're going to submit the answers to a submit API, and we need to know that there was a landing associated with it so we can do things like calculate a response rate. Um, and this actually worked great. Um, believe it or not, most of the time it worked just fine. Um, 
The problem is when you put it in a kiosk type environment and you have people walking up and they finished and it says thanks, and what do they do? They hit the back button. And now we're in trouble, right? Because what's interesting about this is I immediately homed in. We had a very small subset of users who were complaining about this. I looked into it, figured out they were using it in either a kiosk or like a conference environment, um, dropping data. And uh, what was, I, I immediately thought, all right, this must be some sort of caching issue. So I thought, all right, they're in a hotel. And hotel Wi-Fi, like, you know, there's a tendency to do proxy caching and stuff. Um, what's interesting is that it's really often not those proxies and things that get you. I love the original GIF because it said RAM, and my machine's always running out of RAM from Chrome, but I added HTTP GET here. Um, that is that Chrome itself, or your browser in general, if you go look on doing a GET to something like this, and you go back, you'll actually see it, cache it from within the browser. So especially for a small bit of data like this, it'll never even try to go over the wire. Um, but keep in mind, it could be that there's some CDN or caching proxy in there as well. So um, in this case, it, you, know, you kind of look at it and go, all right, well, it sort of makes sense. I get the data that I want. I'm going to use it one time. But it's surprising um, when it is something that's critical that you get a new value, um, you really, it gets going to get you in trouble. So the good news was simple fix. Uh, we changed it to a post, and it works super great now. Um, so basically, if you go back, it's still a post. And the beauty of post, if you haven't uh, spent a lot of time in RFCs, like I have wasted portions of my life on, um, it, it's not allowed to be cached by anything, um, by the spec. Now, are there things that do? Probably, but in general, no. So it's a much safer choice. So in summary, um, looking out for cached calls from browsers, proxies, whatever, when you have that thing that, why is, it, you know, why is this happening? Um, it, look for the gets. Um, using a post instead is obviously an easy fix. If you're stuck in a situation where you can't, quite often just adding some kind of extra query string with some sort of you know, randomly generated cache busting kind of thing can get you out of trouble too. All right. Um, so our next topic is polling APIs. Um, and I think this is probably something that, uh, again, we're maybe a smaller community. Who's had trouble with polling APIs in the past? Anyone? Okay, that's less than I thought. I would have expected we, we started, well, actually, first question I should have asked, who's dealt with gets in the wrong place before, where they should have been post? No? Okay, all right, cool. Yay. I was worried the first one was like super remedial and this one was half, but that's good. All right, so for... Um, Actually, Adam and I have been talking because now that he's at Zapier, we have more talking to do. But um, basically, the, the you know, base implementation for using Zapier at Typeform, which means that when you define your form, you can go and, and configure these zaps, which it's kind of like ift, um, allows the data from your form that gets answered to, to go pass off to whatever. And you know, the simple ones are like Google spreadsheets, but there's a bunch of others. Um, the reality of that, at least a few years ago when we built it, was uh, that, that Zapier's polling us. And uh, for their paying customers, that's every five minutes. And uh, we have, last time I checked, uh, 90 million forms or something like that. Um, now, not every one of those is integrated. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but there's a significant subset that are. And you know, anything times every five minutes over the course of the day adds up. So over time, you know, uh, <laughs> bad things happen. One is that we also figured out that some of our customers were doing this polling, and in some cases, in extreme volume. Um, so the clients are actually going through a lot of work. Um, in our case, it's that they just want to know, is there a new result? Right? Someone went to the, our form that we sent out and hit submit. I just need that data. But to do that, they're having to set up this, this constant service that's polling us. You got anything yet? Right? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Um, and then comparing that with what they already have to see if there's anything new. Now, granted, there's some stuff in the, the data API that we have that makes that reasonable, but it's still like, it's some jumping through hoops to get it. And I'll be honest, like uh, our AWS bill for database utilization has been going up <laughs> over time. It's not pretty. Um, so the thing you're looking for here is you have, as you're designing something, you've got a large data set and you have clients who need to go get an update from it. This is where just providing an API to go retrieve the data 
is actually not a great situation and it could very quickly get you into trouble with clients who say, well, that's cool that I can get the latest um, and there's a way to do it. But what you may find is that query gets expensive over time as the data grows and they're gonna call you every 30 seconds if you let them, maybe every 10 seconds to try to create an interactive experience out of it. Um, also, the, the change of uh, the rate of change within that data is actually quite relevant too. If you have, um, in our case, it's typically one to two weeks is the most common pattern where somebody sends out, you know, maybe it's a quickie survey, um, you know, what do you think about the new HR policy or whatever, right? Um, those things are very high frequency, uh, very high rate of change, and if there's any automation behind it, they're going to be trying to grab it as quick as they can. Um, and, of course, lots of clients. That one matters too, but you'll notice I put it last. It's not always necessarily the biggest problem because if you have data that doesn't change very often and it's maybe not that big of a data set, you can get away with having lots of clients. But when you have the perfect storm of all these things together, it can get ugly pretty quick. So the super simple solution, it's like the first thing I did when we started talking with Typeform is, why don't you guys have webhooks? It just doesn't make sense. So we got that stood up and knew uh, basically all of our current polling clients. By and large, I think we're in the like 90% range now, just in a few months, have switched over to using it. Um, I will add that there's, a, uh, there's another catch to this that I didn't mention, which is that the webhook payload, as often as you can, you need a, po well, actually I did mention it. Uh, you do need a polling API that goes with it. And the reason is, okay, so we stood up webhooks, great. You have a way to get new data sent to you. You go tell us where to send it, we'll send it to you. Somebody just hit submit, you now have the data. Great, don't poll us. However, if they integrated, or if they hadn't integrated before, and they just added webhooks on an embedded form that's been there for two years, they might think, well, I'd like to get caught up. So give me something I can call to go get caught up. And at the end of every day, I want to make sure that I didn't miss any webhooks because maybe my system's eating them and I'm not realizing it. I need a way to go pull and grab the last day's worth of data. But now we're talking about one big download and one big daily download, which maybe isn't even that big depending on the situation. Um, that's a heck of a lot more manageable than checking for new stuff every five minutes or every one minute or every 30 seconds. So, um, very easy solution to add that on. Well, I say very easy. It's not terribly easy to build webhooks, right? You need something that drives events in your system. But um, the, the advantage of it is a way less busy system, right? Um, so, anybody in this trouble now where you have polling happening that hurts? Okay, good. Um, so, hair on fire situation all the time, right? <laughs> um, Obviously, I already said it, like, go build webhooks. Uh, it's great. Um, think about caching, and this one's tricky. Nobody thinks they can cache, ever. That's my experience. When you're dealing with authenticated clients, everyone says, well, if it's cached, then it'll be terrible. But if your poll rate, let's say, is every minute, and you can do a two-minute cache, you just reduce your traffic by 50%. And if, in reality, your customers really only care about every five minutes, and they're just, they implemented it as a one-minute poll because they weren't thinking about it, you might be able to get away with it. Um, in some cases, read-only database, database replicas are a really cheap fix for this. Take the load off of, you know, if you've got one big database still, right? A lot of us do. Um, create that replica, let it deal with the polling work, um, keep it in sync, and obviously there's a lot of approaches to that. And then uh, the one that we've actually moved to, uh, because it's, even though we have a path off, we still have to maintain a lot of that existing polling load, is um, realizing that we had some queries that weren't super efficient in old code that nobody really wants to delve into. And so basically a pre-check. Uh, go peek and check, has anything changed? And there's obviously a lot of ways that you can approach that. Um, storing a cache behind that API that, tells, that keeps track of uh, new things in the last X minutes, X hours, whatever your typical poll rate is. Um, but basically do a cheap check before you do the big expensive database query to go get the newer data. Um, so cheap approaches to try to get out of trouble, right? All right, next topic. Uh, rigid hierarchy, and I really just did this GIF because it's mesmerizing. Um, so 
we're all, you know, everybody's trying to do microservices, yeah? Anybody have, anybody not have a plan to move toward microservices? That guy, <laughs> okay, all right, cool. <laughs> I, I appreciate your rebellious spirit. <laughs> no, really, I do. Um, <laughs> so to give you some insight to, like, you know, you would think, okay, great, I'm building a form, whatever, it's super simple, but building a form for other people's forms is surprisingly complicated. So we end up with this tree of microservices just for managing the data that's stored in one form. Not, and you'll notice there's no responses in here. There's no one answering these forms yet. So in order to maintain, you know, microservices, um, they're well-bounded things. Uh, each little chunk of that domain um, has its own service. Um, and these are all in Go now, and I had to add the cute gopher. Um, so the problem that you run into when you look at, at having a, a user experience or some kind of application that uses these, if you're going to say, great, let's externalize them. We built them to be externalized from the ground up, which if you're not, you should. Um, the problem is now I've got, in this situation, you know, potentially dozens of calls if there's N plus one kind of scenarios in here, um, which maybe I've... I've built it with this in mind that I can handle that query load. The problem is for your typical JavaScript or especially native mobile environments, it's too slow. Like uh, it, it really like it impacts performance in a huge way to do tons of calls. In your typical native mobile environments, calls are queued in series. They can't be done in parallel in many cases. Um, and even in browsers, like it just, it's slow. You don't want to do it. So. Basically, the, the better fix for this, um, and, and I'll add, we, we, talked, we dealt a lot with this at PayPal as well, with the same kind of microservices transition, um, is, and there's kind of a term for it now in, um, I forget the book, but the latest sort of microservices book, um, they call it the BFF, which I think is an adorable name, because it sounds like, you know, it's your best friend API, uh, but it's meant to be back end for front end. Um, so I'm using the term since that's catching on. I've always tended to call it like a composition API or an orchestration API. And it's really just a thin shim. So in our case, we told our front-end JavaScript developers, um, great, you guys know JavaScript. I'm sure you've tinkered in Node. Go build yourself a Node service, and its job is to pull together everything you need for that UX. And I really don't care how it looks, <laughs> to be honest with you, because who else is going to use that? Not too many other uh, applications. It's going to be pretty much built for them. So the, the problem to my domain space of all these microservices is near zero. Um, and if I need something else for other external developers or whatever, I may take that and tweak it from there. But generally speaking, I want to let them own how to define the API that they use rather than having to understand or they do have to understand this domain, um, but, but having to build in this domain space into their application in the front end. And ultimately, now it's one call. So when they render that form, they can do one call and get all of these artifacts all bunched together the way they want it. They're not gluing together a model in the browser. The model's already given to them in the way that they wanted it in the first place. So it cuts down on our JavaScript overhead in terms of processing JSON and doing all this crazy dance. And now we're doing one call. Um, so it's been mentioned a million times here, GraphQL is another thing. Um, I don't, it hasn't worked well for me yet, but in theory, it, it could. And it makes the sloth happier. All right, so um, two big things to look for. One is clients calling microservice design domain APIs. Um, that's generally just right off the bat. You need to start thinking about how to compose things. The second is when you have N plus one calls meaning you call one big thing that's not rich enough, and you have to go call a bunch of other things to fill in the details. Um, that's generally speaking, well, more importantly with N plus one, that you get a list of things that are too thin, and you have to go fill in the details for everything in that list. Now one call turns into one times the number of uh, items in that array, and that hurts. Um, and... I mean, ultimately, the great part about this orchestration or you know, uh, BFF concept is it's fairly easy to add on, right? You're just gluing a shim on top of what you already have. So if you're already doing something like this, build yourself a thin shim that does all the calls to the back end, does one call to the client, and nobody really gets hurt other than old native apps that never update. All right, and our final topic uh, is generic actions. Um, and this is one that, that um, I can't tell you the number of developers who ask 
to do this, and I generally have to go through this whole explanation. So hopefully by publishing it, I won't have to say it very often anymore. Um, an action in my terminology is it's really just an RPC call. Um, it doesn't like fit your, maybe it is a rest, I don't know, I'm not one of those that tries to prove whether or not it is, but it doesn't fit into your CRUD pattern, right? So here we have like forms ID publish. It's an action. And typically these are state transitions that have some additional control. Um, so like in the payments world, um, when you go to cancel a payment, you might have to give a reason. Um, so anytime you have a reason or a description with a state transition, you tend to fall in these action things is working really well. But what everyone wants to do is come up with a, why don't we just do one endpoint and then pass in this, uh, this action stuff as a field, right? Now we have one thing that can do all these state transitions and control them all the same way. Um, it seems great. Uh, so here's a conversation that happens at work after we've launched this and it's live, right? <laughs> Our product owner says, well, is, are, okay, you want to do this. Is it, gonna, is it gonna slow things down? No, it may actually be faster. It's like one endpoint. We have like really optimized code. Cool, um, so now that it's live, can you tell me how many times any of those actions happened? <laughs> Maybe? Um, I'll have to, that, that's fine, we have logs, we have logs, we'll figure it out. But what just happened? We designed a series of phrases in our URLs that tells us nothing when we read this story. So now we go back to the data, to the product owner. Listen, <laughs> um, we need to build this whole new metric system and it's gonna have to go do all these complicated queries to dredge all this stuff out. Or maybe we'll just log the request bodies um, but then we'll have to talk to the data security people. Um, meanwhile, our product owner steps out of the room, <laughs> right? Pissed, why, why didn't you guys think about this? What's the operational aspect of how we run this thing? URLs are a key component in how you operate, operationalize the API, especially with the advent of like the Elk stack and using Kibana. I mean, I freaking live in Kibana and everything, every decision I make is driven off of URLs in production. So cheap is visibility. Now if I have multiple actions, I go to the logs and I see what the actions were and I can produce charts. And as a product owner, I don't have to go ask anyone to run any queries or write the queries for them and embarrass them. Um, so <laughs> our identification is looking for some kind of an action that has a generic name. Um, and there's a lot of ways to call this. Probably somebody calls it metadata. Um, the term for this that I've read before, and I kind of like it, is that it's protocol tunneling. There's a protocol you're going through to take this action. You're tunneling it within some other name, and so you lose visibility. It's really hard to trace down when that particular action breaks. That's bad, too. Um, so if it's already live, um, and I saw some heads bobbing over here giggling. Any, anybody in this thing? No? Okay, that's good. Um, the point is you can basically, even though it's a post and even though you're already passing the action in the, in the post, just throw it onto a query parameter and kind of ignore it, but basically have the client pass some extra data along so you can see it in the logs. All right, so takeaways. Um, the one non-visual slide, it's completely white to prepare you for the onslaught of GIF that's coming. <laughs> so. In all these situations, if you think about how the clients will use the API up front, these things are pretty self-evident. So do the use case analysis right up front. We know, that, uh, we know that Squidward wants to use the hose, but we don't realize he's gonna turn himself into a sprinkler. We have to ask those questions, right? Um, realize that API design is not just fanciful usability discussions and lots of you know, uh, fluffy emotions and feelings about developers experience really is just the first layer. The design itself can actually influence your performance. By the way, it took me like, I, I watched this like 20 times, and if you look at the top of the stack, there's a guy up there. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, so structure is good. We talked about microservices having well-defined domains. I mean, obviously domain-driven design is completely infused into this microservice movement, um, but you know, you have to be ready to blur those lines. Some of these actions, these orchestrations, rigid structure is not gonna get you where you wanna be. It's gonna get you with really pissed off clients, and that's about it, and crappy performance. Um, and finally, 
uh, we can use design in some situations, we outlined all of them here, with some cheap fixes, we can add things to our API design that actually put out production fires um, in terms of performance, in terms of visibility, um, caching. <laughs> uh, and ultimately, when you're designing your API, think about what it's gonna look like in the logs. Right? When we look through those logs, it tells us a transcript of what the APIs were doing, what our clients were doing with them. Um, so design in a way that, think that you're writing a sentence to tell you a story later. That's all I got. Did I go way over time? Yeah, we're gonna take some time. time. All right. Uh, so I'm sure you're all awake from all those animations. So questions for Jason? I'm gonna take them then. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I noticed um, a detail that really interested me. Uh, when you uh, were speaking about uh, webhooks, uh, you told that you've implemented them, and yeah. well, basically 90% of the clients started using, uh, which... I mean, I'll be honest, I don't, we don't have very many clients, so... Uh. <laughs> Again, we're, we're working hard on the developer story, but it's not that impressive right now, in my opinion. Okay, so I, I was just um, going to ask what's the, well, what, what did you do to, to reach those impressive uh, percentage, really? Um, keep a very small developer community and send a really <laughs> nice email. Um, <laughs> I, I had a question on that, though. Yeah. Uh, Audrey talked about uh, streaming, and uh, she recommended server-side, uh, server-sent events, yeah. um, server -sent generally. Events. And in the case you were talking about, you didn't need bi-directional, so why WebSockets and why not server sent events? You could do server sent events if you have browser-based clients. Um, in our case, many, many, many of these cases are, are server-based clients. And you could do that, but um, I'll be honest, maybe I'm just uh, old and cranky, but WebSockets still scare me in scaling. Um, and so being able to send one post and not have to hold a socket open is a lot cheaper. Um, because the predominant use case for us is fairly low volume on the forms, so the total number of, pack of, of pieces of data sent is fairly low, it's very rare that there's super high volume. Okay, great. One more question. Way in Way the back. In the back. <laughs> Way in the back. <laughs> Do you know sign Sit language? Sit further forward next time, huh? Uh, this is a question and a comment. Everybody's talking about hooks, but I mean, we actually implemented them using REST hooks, like like the resthook.org. Did you do something like that, or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seriously, lobbing softballs over here. Yeah, Zapier defined the REST hook standard. Yeah, so okay. Actually, well, we love Zapier. Interestingly, we built webhooks for our customers and released that, and then we took the exact same infrastructure and just built an adapter on top. Uh, to send to interact with Zapier uh, because they use they demand the rest hook thing. All right, thanks for that, Jason. Excellent talk. Another round of applause. So a small, very small token of our appreciation, and then we'll give this.